It is October, and as we have mentioned several times before on a nearly annual basis, there's nothing the world of podcasting likes more than an extremely obvious theme to carry them through an entire month of episode planning. In fact, most people you encounter on the internet, in podcasting or not, like an easy theme they barely have to think about at all. Which is why you get so many things about zombies, Cthulhu, vampires, and the rest of the usual batch of culprits. Granted, we've done it as well, but we think you'll find that our discussions of these sorts of topics have, after all, required a fair bit of thought all on their own. Far be it from us to take the standard view on anything. However, we've noticed a disturbing trend in the last few years. We couldn't quite identify what the problem was on our own, though. It took a random person on Twitter to really nail it down for us. See, we thought that Halloween happened mostly in the last few days of October. You know, from about the 29th to the 31st. That seemed about the right amount of time to celebrate the spooky and scary while making sure you collected all the candy you possibly could. Anyway, what had slowly crawled out of the darkness and into the edges of our consciousness was that Halloween seems to have oozed and expanded out of its natural habitat at the tail end of the month. It had, in fact, begun to squish itself further and further into the early parts of the month until, at last, it burst through the confines of October and started taking over bits of September like some... well, like some sort of plague infecting its neighbors. But as we said, it wasn't until a Twitter user pointed out the actual problem that it all clicked into place for us. Halloween has become the spooky version of the Christmas holiday, spreading far and wide so that it loses all definition, becoming just another occasion to spend frivolously on all its entertaining trappings. Halloween creep. Which, we think, obviously, is a bad idea. Especially if you go back and listen to our much earlier episode on Halloween and remember what it was all supposed to be about in the first place. There, you'll learn that the Halloween tradition began through the cultural diffusion of a number of similar observances from a Celtic tradition called Samhain, which was meant to honor the dead and, most importantly, keep them that way. It's an early and short episode, so it won't take you long to listen to it. But the general idea was that by dressing up as scary things, you could keep the scary ghosts of the dead from running around and doing scary things themselves. Unfortunately, it is already far, far too late for any of that sort of nonsense. The dead have already crossed over into the world of the living, and they did it a long, long time ago. They are, in fact, all around us practically everywhere we look and in everything we do. The ghosts of the dead have taken up residence. You just have to learn how to see them and appreciate how they have been manipulating our lives for quite some time now. Why, no matter where you go or what you do, the chance you haven't been touched by them is very, very slim. You're under the influence of them even now. And no amount of Halloween celebration of spookiness is going to drive them from you. Not once you know about the influence of the cadaver. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Now, to be fair, this is a tricky topic for some folks. In spite of our focus on the historical, scientific, medicinal, and practical side of things, we are still talking about dead human bodies in this episode and the next. And some people, particularly children, will likely find all of this episode from here on out kind of icky, if not downright intolerable, for one reason or another. To those of you who think that might be the case... We can only encourage you to bail out now. For the rest of you, maybe it will help to remember that we'll be focusing on the application of cadavers in the real world once we get through the historical context through our usual lens of making use of them at your gaming table. And we don't just mean coming up with a fourth person to play the bard. In fact, we don't mean that at all. Do not go out and dig up dead people just to fill slots in your game. 
We can't condone that in any way. Though, for many years, this was the only way to get sufficient subjects for all the medical testing and demonstrations that were going on. And of course, those of you who know, know where we are headed already. At some point, we are going to mention Burke and Hare, and then it's all probably downhill from there for a little while. Which is fair enough. Burke and Hare were a nasty pair, and their favorite doctor was little better. But first, a little history, and a bit of a definition. It's reasonable to wonder what the difference is between a cadaver and a corpse. Like, why are there two names for what amounts to the same thing? Well, in an extremely technical sense, there aren't. But equally technically, there are. See, the word corpse comes to us through Middle English, and like most things Middle English, there are a variety of ways to spell it. You have the now standard C-O-R-P-S-E, the much older Cors, C-O-R-S, and the equally as old C-O-R-P-S, Corpse, which is only slightly related to the same C-O-R-P-S that gives us Marine Corps, which refers to a military unit or body of men and comes to us through French from the Latin corpus for body, which is to return to where we began, where the various forms of corpse came from the Middle English borrowing from the Anglo-French from the Latin corpus, even though the two words, corpse and cor, are pronounced differently. Blame the French for that one. Basically, corpse, in whatever form, refers to a body of a person or people, depending on how it is being used. Now, it is true that the word cadaver also refers to a dead body, and it too comes to us from Latin. The root word cadere means to fall. And if that has you wondering what it has to do with dead bodies, let's pause a moment and discuss executions during the Roman Republic period. The Tarpeian Rock is a steep cliff on the south side of Capitoline Hill, one of the seven hills of Rome. As a side note, it's where the English word capital comes from, thanks to the Romans' belief that the hill was indestructible and therefore the perfect spot to build numerous important temples and other buildings. The Tarpeian Rock was, during the Roman Republic, a place of execution for some of the most heinous criminals of the time. Normally, the Romans favored strangulation as the preferred form of execution for your run-of-the-mill criminal. But certain people, traitors or those who gave false testimony, for instance, got one free attempt to learn how to fly by being tossed off the Tarpeian Rock onto the ground 80 feet below. Anyone who didn't die, and you would certainly want to be dead by the time you got to the bottom, was then beaten to death by people waiting with clubs below to finish the job. If you'd like to learn more about Roman executions and their concept of murder, we cannot recommend the book A Fatal Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, Murder in Ancient Rome, by Emma Southen, highly enough. We won't go into it much further here, except to say that this practice of throwing offenders off the cliff is where dead bodies get associated with the word for to fall in Latin, which then leads us to cadaver. And the reason even the Romans made the distinction between corpse and cadaver is because those sentenced to being thrown from the rock, whatever their status, were often considered to no longer be people, or hadn't been considered to be people, Roman people at least, in the first place, often being slaves. And so, couldn't be the corpus of someone specific, which meant their subsequent bodies were just another form of matter you could do what you liked with afterwards. They were even less of a person at the end of their life than they had been during their fall, and so the word cadere came along to describe them instead, just something that had fallen off the cliff. Nothing important. Which meant you could take the cadaver, if you had a mind to, and experiment on it. And in our modern usage, this is the difference between a corpse and a cadaver. A corpse is more or less a dead body of any sort, but a cadaver is a corpse with a purpose. Or rather, a corpse for which someone else has a purpose, someone other than the original owner, as it were. And that purpose was and is usually dissection. For the first dissections, you have to go all the way back to about 300 BCE and the Egyptians, which makes a bit of sense if you think about it. They did mummies, you see, 
And mummies don't really work if you don't take the insides out first. But that doesn't really count. Mummification was just removing bits without really trying to understand how the bits work. And it would take Ptolemy the first to come along and say, Hey guys, have you ever really wondered how all those squishy bits we put in the jars work? And what they do while a chap's still alive? No? Well, maybe you should, because I'm king and I'd like to know. And so Ptolemy made it okay for the Egyptian physicians to dissect executed criminals to find out how they worked. And as often as not, Ptolemy himself would dive right in and help out. He was weird like that. And so, Egyptians began the first investigations into anatomy with Egyptian criminals. Unfortunately, it was the Greeks who would give birth to the father of anatomy at about the same time. Herophilos was a Greek physician and early anatomist. Funnily enough, he was born in Chalcedon, see our episode, and spent most of his life in Alexandria, Egypt, just at the time it was becoming okay to dissect people. Notice we didn't say corpses or cadavers. Sure, Herophilus did dissect cadavers, quite a few of them, but mostly what he was remembered for, aside from the nine volumes of anatomical observations and notes he compiled, was some 600 vivisections he performed. Vivisection, in case you're having difficulty with the word, is just like dissection. Except you don't actually wait for the person to die. You just go ahead and operate on live prisoners. Now, to be fair, someone was going to have to do it sometime. There are certain things about the human body that cannot be understood if you cannot see them in operation in a living example. The hearts of the dead do not beat. Lungs do not expand and collapse with the aid of the diaphragm. Nerves do not transmit signals, that sort of thing. It was inevitable that live specimens would be needed at some point to really come to grips with how a body works. And Herophilus's contributions to medicine and science were significant. His books covered subjects like the flow of blood through the human body, the duration and phases of childbirth, and he even nailed that whole the brain is the thinky bit thing that so many people had thought was centered on the heart instead. His work would eventually lead to discarding the up until then accepted theory of the body being ruled by the four humors about which see our episode on the Chirurgian. Probably the most objectionable part was that he did these things in front of a live studio audience. And Alexandria, thanks to Ptolemy, was one of the very, very few places in the world you could dissect a cadaver, let alone live people, and not get in serious trouble for it. So people came from all over the world to stand in the open-air amphitheaters and watch Herophilus work. But honestly, 600 dissections on live criminals seems a bit much, even if you aren't very fond of criminals. Between this and the regular dissections, it wasn't long before Herophilus was charged with some sort of criminal activity, and dissections were shut down for the next 1800 years or so. Literally, no one else is on record as having cut into a human body to see how it all worked in the intervening years. Which, if you know anything about anything, can't possibly be true. It's just that thanks to various religious practices and a variety of faiths around the world, it would be a very bad idea to actually admit to and then write down that you were doing dissections. Most religions have a taboo centering around the sanctity of the body after death, often on the grounds that if a body was taken apart here on earth, how then would it appear whole in whatever afterlife was on offer? Mostly, anyone who was known to be practicing dissection was in big trouble if the word got out with the local religious authority. So, any work being done tended to be kept very hush-hush. Eventually, certain royal or religious dispensations were made for those training to be physicians, in order that they might do dissections as part of learning their craft, and thereby perhaps kill fewer people they were meant to be making better. And typically, the cadavers of executed criminals were given over to various medical schools for this purpose which, by the 18th and 19th centuries in Britain, began to be something of a problem. See, there were lots of shiny new medical schools opening all over Europe, but especially in Britain and Scotland. The problem being that while there might be more schools, there weren't more criminals being executed often enough to satisfy demand. At the time, there was no such thing as donating your body to science, so the only legally available bodies were executed murderers. 
if no one is executing any murderers this week, where are the medical schools supposed to get the bodies? This was particularly a problem of the English and Scottish. If they couldn't get full cadavers to work on, they risked losing students to the medical schools of France, where it was perfectly acceptable to make use of the unclaimed corpses of the poor from the city's hospitals for dissection, and the French had lots of those. So something had to be done to keep Scotland and England schools on the cutting edge. And thus began, in little ways, a descent into apparent madness. Anatomists would, on occasion, remove a recently deceased family member to the dissecting chamber before seeing them off to the churchyard. In her book, Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, from which much of this episode is drawn, Mary Roach notes that 17th century surgeon anatomist William Harvey, famous for discovering the human circulatory system, also deserves fame for being one of few medical men in history so dedicated to his calling that he could dissect his own father and sister. It was either that or dig them up yourself. Not your relatives, of course, but the recently dead belonging to other folks, which, as you might imagine, was even then a mighty big no-no. Except that it wasn't. A big no-no, we mean. Oh, sure, you might not like it if you went down to the churchyard to leave flowers on Uncle Reuben's grave only to discover he wasn't in it anymore. But it wasn't illegal to take possession of a corpse. Grave robbing was illegal. Disturbing a grave was illegal. But having a corpse around the place wasn't. So if you happen to be caught with someone's dead Aunt Polly's pearl necklace in your pocket or someone saw you unearthing someone's dead Aunt Polly, you could expect legal repercussions. But if you were caught with someone's dead Aunt Polly slung over your shoulder, there wasn't anything legally wrong with that. Some instructors would encourage their students to go out and find that week's cadaver, with some Scottish schools allowing their students to pay tuition in corpses. In any case, once you were done with your anatomy lessons, the next problem became how to dispose of the cadavers you had acquired in, if not an illegal, certainly an unsavory manner. Most were, over the course of the dissection, reduced to component parts and frequently reburied. Not back where they came from, but in a freshly dug, shallow grave out behind the university's buildings. Though rumors of the day had the anatomists doing everything from enriching the diets of local zoo animals, to boiling everything down to make soap and candles like some sort of early fight club. And so it went. The public felt preyed upon, particularly the poor, since the rich could afford to have protective measures set up over and around their graves to prevent themselves from disappearing. Cages over coffins, coffins with spring closures, even coffins wrapped in iron and set into concrete were all tried to keep the anatomists and their cohort of body snatchers out. And to a certain extent, they must have been successful because anatomists themselves were making arrangements to have their bodies sufficiently protected to prevent them being dug up in the event of their own death. And into this chaotic state of affairs stepped Edinburgh anatomist Robert Knox, a man who, in spite of all the good intentions he may have had, was about as unsavory as they came. In 1827, Knox needed bodies for his anatomy classes, so when a pair of men with a dead body at their feet knocked on his door one night, he was only too happy to invite them in for a little chit-chat and hear their proposition. Mr. William Burke met Mr. William Hare in the fall of 1827 while working on a harvest together. The two hit it off, and by November shared lodgings, together with their wives, in Edinburgh at a lodging house owned by Hare. Hare rented rooms to lodgers, and the pair soon got a reputation for being loud, obnoxious drunks. Unfortunately for Hare, one of his other lodgers, a man named Donald, died before he could receive his quarterly pension and ended up owing four pounds of rent. Hare was very bitter about the loss, but soon perked up when he and Mr. Burke decided to take the corpse and sell it to an anatomist at Edinburgh University. After a bit of a shell game with the coffin and the body, the two men soon had it in hand and ended up at Robert Knox's front door. In the end, 
Burke and Hare sold the body to Knox for seven pounds, ten shillings, and split the money between them, allowing for Hare's back rent. As they left, the anatomist's assistants told them that Knox would be glad to have more bodies, if they should happen upon any. Well, curiously enough, the two men did happen upon more bodies. Fifteen more, to be precise, over the course of the next year. A miller named Joseph was swiftly followed by a salt seller by the name of Abigail Simpson. Supposedly, the miller had been taken by fever and become delirious. Burke and Hare, trying to quiet the man and restrain him, had, perhaps inadvertently, accidentally, not on purpose, we promise, smothered him with a pillow. His body was taken to Knox and sold for ten pounds, a handsome profit by any measure. Abigail was suffocated by hand after first having been got drunk by the two men. When they took her body to Knox, he remarked how pleased he was with its freshness, but asked no other questions. Margaret Hare invited an elderly woman into the house and gave her enough whiskey to render her unconscious. When Hare himself returned home, he smothered the woman with a mattress cover. Ten pounds again. Which, just to be absolutely clear, when converted to 2021 20, pounds, is 1,115 pounds and change or roughly 1,171 U.S. dollars. In April of 1828, Burke picked up two women and took them to his brother's house, where he attempted to get them both drunk enough to pass out. Only one did, Mary Patterson, while the other, Janet Brown, remained conscious enough to witness the argument that ensued when Burke's wife showed up and thought Burke was having an affair. After Brown left, Burke's wife went to fetch Hare and his wife, Burke and Hare locked their wives out of the room and then smothered Patterson. When they turned the body over to Knox's assistance, it was still warm, though they only received eight pounds for the body. Eventually, of course, Janet Brown returned and wanted to know what had become of her friend. She was told Mary had gone to Glasgow with a traveling salesman. In mid-1828, a woman named Mrs. Haldane was killed and her body sold. A few weeks later, when Mrs. Haldane's daughter came looking for her, she took rooms in Hare's boarding house and was herself killed, but this time only Mr. Burke participated in the murder and so cleared the eight pounds all for himself. After that, Burke came across a local police constable struggling to get a drunk woman home, offered to see her there himself, and subsequently made another ten pounds. The pair followed this up by killing a woman lodger and her boy, which disturbed Burke, but not enough to turn down eight pounds for each of the bodies. And look, it doesn't get any better from here. They kill a well-known local man, but no one really gets suspicious enough to work things out, and Knox is quick with a scalpel, moving the cadaver to the front of the dissection line. The pair aren't geniuses, and definitely not criminal masterminds. Their final victim is the one that does them in, because they have other lodgers in the house at the time who managed to notice a crime has occurred and discover the body of Margaret Doherty badly hidden beneath the bed straw. They fly off to alert the police, and the whole thing comes tumbling down. By the end, Hare turns state's evidence and rats out Burke. Robert Knox is never tried for his role, as there were no charges that could be reasonably brought against him, and he claimed to believe the pair had simply hung out around boarding houses, waiting for someone to die, and buying up the bodies before anyone else could. So William Hare is let off, and Knox is never charged. What then of William Burke? Well, he was found guilty by a jury, and given the following sentence. Your body should be publicly dissected and anatomized, and I trust that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved in order that posterity may keep in remembrance your atrocious crimes. And so it was, on display still at the Edinburgh Medical School. Oh yeah, and the day of Burke and Hare's final murder where everything fell apart for them? October 31st, 1828. We're going to need another episode.
Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. If you haven't already, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcatcher so you can catch the second part of this episode in two weeks. You wouldn't want to miss out on the really disturbing bits, would you? This show is made possible by the kind support of our fans on Buy Me a Coffee and Patreon. We're undergoing a shift in support means at the moment, so if you're a patron on Patreon, take a look at our Buy Me a Coffee page and get things headed in that direction. And if you are encouraged to begin supporting us for the first time, head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and join in with the excellent folks there. Perks include free transcripts, bonus episodes, and even special Discord access depending on your support level. Give it a look and see what fits you best. Both Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers by Mary Roach, and A Fatal Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, Murder in Ancient Rome by Emma Southen, are available on Amazon. Links in the show description. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Death. It doesn't have to be boring. <laughs>